Hello, everybody, and welcome to BPK 409, Wearable Technology and Human Physiology. My name is Patrick Meyerhofer, and today we'll talk a little bit about the basic principles of data acquisition. Before we go into detail, I'd like to tell you the three main things that I would like you to take away from this lecture today. First of all, we'll talk about how we make measurements from the real world. Second of all, we'll talk about the principles that govern how we make these measurements. And third of all, we will also go into the characteristics of those measurements. So we'll talk about how we can, how those measurements get from the basic physical phenomena into how it afterwards looks like at the computer and why it looks the way that it does on our computer. First of all, what is data acquisition? Well, we start off with a physical phenomena, like for example, my voice, or my blood pressure or any other measure that we can take from the human body. And we end up with a matrix of data on a computer that quantifies our signal and that we can afterwards analyze and even plot to visualize our data. As we can measure a signal, we can also create a signal. This would be going the other way in this graph. We can create a signal in a software and adjust it for an actuator and the actuator can then create the actual physical phenomenon. We can measure noise with sensors like a microphone, but we can also create noise with actuators like a speaker. In this course, we'll mainly focus on the top graph of, of this, um, in the top part of this graph, um, so the measurements with sensors and not too much into the actuation of physical phenomena. But there is one thing that sensors and actuators actually have in common. They're both transducers. So, the, so transducers are devices that convert an input energy of some form into an output energy of a different form. So in some way, sensors and actuators are both, trans, or not just in some way, sensors and actuators are actually both transducers, and, but they are kind of like the reverse of each other. For example, a microphone is a sensor that converts sound energy in the form of a changing air pressure into electrical energy, whereas a speaker is an actuator that converts the electrical energy into the sound energy. Steve Jobs actually used this principle when he was still going to high school. So in the house of his family, he converted the transducers of speakers in their house so that he could actually use them as microphones and um, ultimately spy on his family everywhere in the house without them even knowing about this. So in terms of our goal of acquiring data, the sensor is the integral component that converts our physical phenomena into an electrical signal that can be brought into our hardware. Some common examples of sensors are accelerometers that we will use, for example, in the first part of this course, or thermometers, or strain gauges, or like we've already talked about, microphones. Maybe another thing that is very important to mention here is that sensors do actually not always directly measure what we think that they measure. For example, when we think that a sensor measures force, they do actually sense the change in shape or the strain of the gauge. So in a lot of cases, sensors do indirectly measure what we want them to measure. Another example here is um, measure or is a thermometer. A thermometer is not directly measuring the temperature, but it's actually indirectly, or it's actually measuring the change of volume in mercury. So it's very important that those sensors are very well um, calibrated because we need to know exactly in the example of the thermometer, um, how much of a change of volume corresponds to how much of a change in temperature. So for our course, as I've already mentioned, our sensors um, will be different sensors, but in lab one, for example, the sensor will be the accelerometer. So now we're at the point where we have used a transducer, the sensor to go from some physical phenomena to an electrical signal, like which is in a lot of cases, a voltage. The next step is what we call signal conditioning, where we might decide that we need to alter our signal in some way or another, before sending it to our um, acquisition hardware. So in a lot of cases, we want to alter the signal in a certain way, but in some cases we also need to 
um, I, um, change it in a certain way so that we can actually use it afterwards for analysis. More times than not, the reason for signal conditioning is to remove noise. Noise can come from different sources. We can get noise from, we can get internal noise um, which arises from inside our equipment, but more commonly we get noise that arises from external sources. A big one that we can pick up from lights and other electrical devices is at 60 hertz for incandescent lights or at 120 hertz for fluorescent lights. In the ECG lab, you'll also learn a bit about um, removing 60 hertz noise, noise, which you might get when you have um, your computer connected to the power plug of your house. The noise comes from the AC power line where in North America, the standard cycle frequency is at 60 hertz. How can we not actually condition the signal in a way that removes noise? One approach is to amplify the signal. You can imagine if you have a signal of a certain magnitude of a low voltage and as it travels through the wires, a noise of about the same magnitude gets added that our signal gets really obscured. If we already amplify the signal right away, so before it travels through the wires, um, you can see here that if this low um, noise now gets added, um, it doesn't obscure our data or our signal as much as it did before. Another approach is um, to remove noise with filtering. If you want to remove high frequency noise, you can use something that is called a low pass filter. So you can see this here, like in this case, um, the low frequency is what we want to keep. And if we let the low frequencies pass and we um, remove the high frequency, this is what we, what we get in the end. On the other hand, we have high pass filters where a high pass filter, like um, let's say now um, that the signal we actually want is the high frequency here and we want to remove the low frequency here then we can use a high pass filter to in the end get this kind of signal. There are also um, not just high and low pass filters, there's also something which actually removes high, high frequencies and low frequencies and it just keeps a, a very certain um, part of the frequencies which is called a band pass filter. We will actually in our course have to work with um, high frequency noise with, um, like I told you guys before, when you have a computer plugged into the, uh, into the power, you might want, uh, you might get 60 Hertz noise and we want to remove this. So for this, we will use um, a low pass filter like this here. But on the other hand, we also sometimes get noise from like the shaking of the wires, which will give us a very low frequency noise, which looks like this, and then we'll use high pass um, filters for this problem. Signal conditioning can happen in a lot of different stages of the data acquisition process. Some sensors do already do some filtering to reduce the noise before they send out the signal and before it travels through any wires. In our case, signal conditioning can also happen in the microcontroller later. So the point that I want to drive home here is that um, signal conditioning is not always um, one device that does this, but it can actually happen in a few different and more than just one stage of the data acquisition process. Let's now talk about how the signal gets from the sensor to the computer. For this, we need to capture the electrical signal from the sensor and translate it into a language that the computer can read. This is what the acquisition hardware is here for. I want you to understand that up to this point, we were usually talking about an analog signal. Analog means that it is continuous in time and space. But to store data on a computer, we need the information to be digitized, which means that we need it in discrete values. In some cases, a sensor already provides us with the digitized information. There are, for example, some accelerometers out there that do not, that do not send out the um, electrical signal, but they actually already give us the actual G-forces measured. In most cases, though, our, um, our sensors send the analog signal via the electrical signal. So before we can analyze the data on our computer, we need to convert the analog signal to a digital one. We need to go from this signal to this signal here. So what is now the difference between the analog signal and the digital one? Has any of you ever seen a record player? And the question is, how many grooves are there on a vinyl record? 
Anyone? No one? Okay, so there are, in total, there are two. There is one on each side. Only one groove on each side because a record player uses an analog signal and analog means that it is continuous. The sound is created from the needle traveling through the hills and valleys of the groove and it gets then transmitted to the diaphragm which itself vibrates and creates the sound. If we want the same song now saved on our computer, we need a digital version of this vinyl. So we have to transform those hills and, val and valleys into a digital language. If we do this with high resolution and a high sampling frequency, our ear will not be able to hear the difference anymore. I will go more into the idea of resolution frequency in the next slides. Digitization is the process of converting continuous analog signals, so signals from the real world, into discrete digital values via the combination of sampling and quantization. I will explain the terms sampling and quantization in a minute. So let's pretend now that this signal here is analog. Let's say it's continuous. What I'm saying here is that we want to go from the signal that you can see here into something that looks something like that. To digitize this, we need to create a discrete set of um, times in which we store the value. Like we need to take a snapshot of all those points in time. This is called sampling. And in our case, this is happening on the, and in most cases, this is happening on the x-axis in this graph here. So we are sampling, in this case, every single second. We're taking a value of our data every single second. So the sampling is happening on the x-axis. Now the amplitude also needs to be divided in discrete values. So this is called quantization. When I digitize my original signal, the values that I store are the closest discrete values at each point in time. So in our case here, that's the, uh, that's the y-axis. As you can see here, um, so for example, if we are looking for, which data point is good to show here. So here, for example, the blue line is actually a little bit above the red point, but we are always looking for the um, closest of those discrete values. So in that case, it decided on 0 0.4 um, volts. There are two terms um, that are important to note at this point. Um, one of them is sampling frequency and the other one is resolution, which I've talked before with the record player. So the sampling frequency is one over the time between the samples, it is in Hertz. So the sampling frequency in our case is one over one. So now we are sampling with one Hertz, which means um, once a second. The resolution is the minimum difference between the discrete um, amplitudes. So the resolution in our case is 0 0.2 watts because um, we are always sampling with, uh, so that the, the minimum difference between uh, our data points here is 0 0.2 watts. So we are measuring zero or 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, but we cannot measure a value of 0 0.1 in this case, for example. After sampling and quantization, we have our discrete value, but now we need to store this value somehow. As we know, computers store values a little bit differently than how we humans would write them down. When we write down numbers, we use something that's called a base 10 system. So we, we use values between zero and nine. Computers store information using a binary system with, the base, with a base two, which means that they're only using zeros and ones. Just for definition purposes, um, a binary digit, so a zero or a one, is called a bit and is therefore the smallest unit of storage that a computer can have. Let's now take the number 42 and see how a, a human and a computer would write down this differently. So in a base 10 system, we would write down 42 with four tens and two ones. So we would use a 10 to the power of the one and a 10 to the power of the zero, of zero to get to 42. Compared to this, when we use a binary system, we would sum up 32, so two to the power of five, eight, which means two to the power of three, and two, which means two to the power of one. So to write down 42 in a binary system, we need at least six digits or at least six bits, meaning one, two, three, four, five, six. This also means that the more bits a computer is using, 
the more different values we can store. Let's now combine what we have learned about digitization with the concept of bits. Recall that quantization involves dividing up our amplitudes into evenly spaced discrete values. From the last slide, we have also learned that the number of bits our hardware has dictates the number of different values our um, y-axis can be broken into. So it dictates the resolution of our data. For example, let's look at this diagram. Here we have eight different values at the y-axis. So we are from zero to seven, which means eight different values. This means that our converter is, has three bits. Let's now have a look at a specific example. So this here is the continuous signal. This here is the continuous signal, okay? So if we look at, if, if we want to quantize um, the data point at 0 0.5 seconds, it goes to the closest um, y-axis value, which in this case is three, okay? And if we now want to digitize the value three, so for us, that's three, three volts or whatever, but for the computer, we have to store it um, in binary digits. So three would now be zero, one, one, because two to the power of one is two, plus two to the power of zero is one, um, and two plus one is three. So three can be digitized with a digital binary number of zero, one, and one. Another important hardware setting for us is called the input range. It is very important that we set the input range appropriately for the signal that we are trying to measure. If our input range, for example, is too wide, then we, many of our possible y-axis values are wasted because uh, the signal never approaches those values. This ultimately reduces our resolution and causes greater quantization errors. So if we, for example, have an accelerometer that, can, that sends values between zero and five volts, but our hardware measures values between zero and 10 volt, then we waste a lot of potential of accuracy and resolution. If our input range is too wide though, then we might miss parts of our signal. This is called clipping, and that's the opposite of what we've talked before. If the accelerometer, for example, sends values between zero and 10 volts, but our hardware just measures values between zero and five volts, we might lose a lot of important information in our data. So in this graph, you can see that very well. So for example, if our um, actual data looks like this, so that's the data that the sensor is sending, but this here is what, but the red one is what our hardware can then measure, then we're losing this part of the data. You can also think about taking a picture. So if you wanna take a good picture of the face, you don't wanna zoom in so close that you're clipping off, or that you're like um, cutting off half of the face. That would be the clipping example. But on the other hand, you also don't wanna zoom out so far that like the face is super, super small. And when you zoom in, that your face get pixelated. So in that case, um, um, that would just be uh, when you have a too big of a range. Okay, the last few slides have helped you to understand how to set the magnitude ranges at the y-axis. Now we'll talk a little bit about how to set the sampling frequency, which is the part or which is our x-axis in most in our graphs because that's the time. When we sample from a continuous analog signal, we're always going to lose some of the information. The question is, how often do we have to find a data point so that we're not using important characteristics of our data. Sometimes we don't even want to have um, a huge amount of sampling frequency, so like a lot of data points every second, because um, for some reasons we don't want we we cannot store that much data. So sometimes we want to find like a sweet spot of how much sampling frequency do we need to capture the characteristics of the data, but to also being able to store it easily on the computer or for example, a microSD that also has um, a maximum um, storage at some point. So the Nyquist theorem answers this question. The Nyquist theorem says that the sampling rate needs to be equal or greater than twice the highest frequency component of the analog signal we're trying to measure from. If we drop below this magical Nyquist frequency, we run into a problem which is called aliasing. 
So if you look at this, if you look at this diagram here, we want to measure this gray signal here. If we drop, um, our, if, if our sampling frequency is too low, then those are the data points that we are um, collecting. And it in the end looks almost like a parabola, even though it should be this wave here that we would like to, we would like to measure. Um, you might even know this um, problem from, for example, looking at a wheel that is turning or a propeller of, a, of an airplane. Sometimes it actually looks like the wheel or the propeller are turning backwards. This is because even our human eye has a certain sampling frequency. And if the turning of the wheel or the propeller is too high that we're sampling like it's happening here, then it looks to our eye like it's actually turning in the wrong direction or sometimes it even looks like it's standing still even though it's still turning. This is actually called the wagon wheel effect and you can read about it online. So this is all that needs to be done by the acquisition hardware. Um, the acquisition hardware needs to do the digitization. So from the analog signal to the, the digital signal. So it needs to sample the analog signal with a certain sampling frequency and a given resolution. In our case, the acquisition hardware will be our microcontroller. And from here, we can store the data on our computer and later post analyze it in a specific software. In our case, this software will be Python. In a lot of cases, um, the signal at this point will still be too noisy. So sometimes in Python, we even still have to do some signal conditioning. So as I've told before, signal conditioning is actually happening in a lot of different stages of the data acquisition. And in our case, we'll also do some signal conditioning in Python. After we have post analyzed our data and post prepared the data on Python, we can then also use Python to visualize the data, which is then a graph that hopefully will look as beautiful as this graph here. In the last slide, I would like to quickly talk about how we humans also do data acquisition. Let's, for example, think about a sound. If we want to measure sound, then we have a sensor that can do that, which is our ear. In our ear, we convert sound waves into vibration and ultimately into an electrical signal. This is basically the acquisition hardware that prepares the signal for our computer, which is then the brain. Our ear even has an input range because there are a lot of frequencies that we cannot hear anymore. So we have a frequency range within that we can hear the sound and outside of that range, we cannot hear the sounds anymore. The software for the brain are our synapses and their connections within the brain, which then can analyze the data and in the end, um, we can hear this sound. If you want on the other side to use our voice and to create a sound, we can do this whole spiel into the other direction. Our synapses, so our software, can prepare a signal in our brain. We then convert the electrical signal into muscle force that creates muscle contraction. The actuator in that case is our lungs, that creates the airflow and our voice box that vibrates and creates the sound waves, which is then the physical phenomenon of um, voice. With this, I hope that you have enjoyed the lecture on data acquisition and that we will have a lot of fun together in the next weeks, collecting some actual physiological data and using all the knowledge that we have created today to, in the end, get into a visualization of the data that we have before collected with our sensors. I guess that's it from me today and I'm super looking forward for you guys seeing you soon. Bye-bye.